in these 21 days, we are basically trying to activate the nadis to clean up the chakras and uh, to make the system responsive to cosmic energies. That's what we are actually trying to do in the 21 days. Once a sufficient um, amount of energy is released into the system, then you make it. Uh, what we are doing is, uh, one is we are giving you some teachings and the other is we are giving you dikshas to help you realize those teachings. Understanding them intellectually is one thing, but to actually realize them is something totally different. So it is a combination of teaching and uh, diksha uh, which gives you the necessary transformation. So we are trying to actually bring down the lobes of the brain and uh, make you experience the state. That's what we are trying to do in the 21 days. Nadis, to clarify, the nadis are the energetic pathways. Yes, exactly that. Are they in the body or outside the body? They are within the body, but they are non-physical in nature. Mm -hmm. Energetic pathways, yes. rather like in acupuncture. Yes. yes. See, we have known people who were 10 years, 12 years, got nothing at all. Not even a single insight, not a single experience, but all of a sudden became completely enlightened. So I would tell them, just don't worry about it. The, uh, the less you worry about it, the better chances it could happen any time. Mm. It could happen while you are sleeping, while you are walking, or having a morning breakfast, any time it could happen. So, and I have assured them that the whole of mankind is going to make it. Mm -hmm. So why worry? Have a good time until then. <laughs> because this enlightenment that we are talking about is something which is going to happen to the planet. It's a planetary transition and it is not very far away. So why worry? The others who can make it, they can help hasten the process. That's all. It's not as though the saint is going to get it and the sinner is not going to get it. Saint or sinner is not going to make any difference. Uh, in fact, uh, we have had very degenerate people who have come from all over the world, including in India, but t terribly degenerate people, and they have just become enlightened. By no stretch of imagination, they could have become enlightened, but they have become. What we are aiming at is uh, the complete abolition of the course itself. Mm. Because uh, we do not want to con uh, continue with the courses, you know. Mm. Uh, we want humanity to get there, not be conducting courses. Mm. So this is just a preparation to get ready the people and then the whole of mankind makes it. It's not that it will be continuing year after year forever, no. Not that it will become an organized religion or an organized structure, no. We are very clear about it. मन मंदिर में ही हंसते रहना मेरे प्रभु मेरे कानों में कुछ कुछ कहते रहना मेरे प्रभु मेरे मन मंदिर में ही हंसते रहना मेरे प्रभु मेरे कानों में कुछ कुछ कहते रहना मेरे प्रभु Yes. See, basically, it's like this. Um, see, Amma Bhagavan are there, and uh, we have made these 170 dasas uh, fully enlightened. So, in a sense, the phenomena has become more powerful because of their addition. Now, it's easy to affect the people uh, who live uh, surrounding us. They get added on, and the phenomenon becomes more powerful. Using that power, we would like to enlighten India as quickly as possible, then that number gets added on and it becomes very powerful. Mm. Then at that point of time, the West, wherever they are, uh, through just a single diksha, they can make the Western world enlightened. Mm. So that is our, uh, it's like uh, 
uh, stepping up the power gradually in phases. Like if you have a, to start a huge uh, electric motor, you can't straight away start it. It is a small motor, use that to start a bigger one, use that to start a bigger one, it goes on like that. That's how you could start the big motor, you know. Because that is now already happening in the villages now. We believe the same thing could be replicated in the Western world. For that, the whole country has to become enlightened. India, because in this land we have prepared the people for thousands of years, so they can tune into it very easily. And to make India enlightened, we have to make these villages enlightened. So that's the work which is now going on. Mm. So it is uh, first the dasas, then the village, the 150 odd villages. Actually, we call it a 100 village project, mm. but in fact, it's much more than that. Mm. And then that steps up uh, the Indian motor. Mm. And then uh, the Western, the, those in Japan, China, everywhere, they get the power to give enlightenment. Mm. And the whole world is through. Mm. That's the idea. <laughs> we have seen very dramatic changes like uh, the village behaving like one family, mm. respecting its elders, respecting its children, taking care of them, respecting the women who have come into the village mm. and um, uh, there's uh, people giving up the habit of drinking, of uh, smoking and uh, meat eating. So many dramatic changes have happened and uh, those were legal battles having out of the court settlement. So many dramatic changes have started to happen. <clears throat> uh, many dramatic changes have started happening uh, mm. in the villages. Mm. The other thing that I heard, as well as the changes you mentioned, which I think is very touching and significant, is there's been significant reduction in spousal abuse, men beating their wives. That is dramatically reduced. Yes, yes. I yeah. actually heard this from a government official. Which yes. Is yeah. Very reassuring and it's yes. something I'd love to see yes. spread all over the world. Yes. Yes, that is what we expect to happen. Here we have found, in fact, that in a village, uh, as 30-40% uh, of people get the dikshas, and the others without diksha are able to move into similar states. When five, six villages uh, get transformed, the seventh or eighth one it is happening automatically. So, of course, we go through the formality of the diksha, but by and large, they're already there. So, we also believe in the same principle. Mm -hmm. And you found it to be true? Yes. Yes. In fact, after the dikshas and their transformation, they are uh, uh, becoming more prosperous. Had you visited them about uh, five years ago, you would have been struck by the abject poverty. There used to be no rains here. In the summer, people actually died because of the heat. That was the condition. After uh, the dikshas happened, nobody has died from heat. It has been raining on time, and there have been such rains that they had to pray for uh, the rains to stop. The rains have stopped and they're getting very good crops, all based completely on prayer. And the prosperity levels have gone up enormously. There was just one Jeep uh, four years ago. Now there are about, I think, about 75 Jeeps are there. You do not have these buildings uh, four or five years ago. They've all come up. So there's a rising prosperity in the villages. So strangely, uh, accompanied with the state, there's also uh, prosperity also is uh, uh, flowing in along with the state. As far as we are concerned, once you are uh, free of your mind, mm. it does not matter whether you subscribe to uh, the Indian tradition mm. or the or Western modernity. Mm. It does not seem to matter at all. Mm. So uh, we are not against uh, the Western TV or, uh, uh, or the, the Western kind of food or clothing uh, because you are out of your mind. 
So, it, which means you could enjoy anything without being addicted to it. Mm. So, we do not see it as any danger at all. Mm -hmm. And the Jeep certainly have made life more comfortable yes. because you were going to be a bullock cart earlier. Yeah. You had no idea about the world, the TV has brought the world right into your dressing room. Mm. So, it has made a world of difference and uh, we are not against uh, what the West has to offer. Mm. The West has uh, built up a physical paradise. Uh, now, what we need is an inner paradise. And if uh, both are combined, it is heaven on earth. Mm. What's the point in just merely being enlightened but uh, rolling in abject poverty? Yes. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit more about society and, and particularly about politics. Politics in most parts of the world is dominated by people with a lust for power. Yes. So you have to really, really want power yes. in order to get into a position of power. Yes, yes. And this is usually accomplished by getting the financial support of, of wealthy backers, which are very often... Mm -hmm. Uh, have commercial interests. Yes. These backers are large corporations. Yes. So really, to, to be straightforward about it, I think in many countries, politics is dominated by a, a form of kind of legalized bribery. Yes. That a corporation can, can pay for a politician, the politician then has an obligation to reward the corporation. What effect might the... the what you're doing in these hundred villages and beyond have on politics? Is there another way we could have politics than what we're seeing now? We are talking of the golden age where uh, people would be totally transformed. When we say they would be transformed, what we, what we mean by that is they would no more engage in self-centered activity uh, because uh, the self is gone. You only live for the whole of mankind. So these are the people who would be in politics. Politicians who are not self-centered, who are not narrow-minded. Similarly, uh, bureaucrats and technicians who are not self-centered and uh, spiritual leaders who are not self-centered because they could also be self-centered and um, businessmen who are no longer self-centered. So it's like one big family and everybody working for the other. So we expect things to change very dramatically in politics. The result would be actually power would percolate down to the level of the common man. Mm. So such dramatic things are most likely to happen because nobody is going to be after power. Mm. So power would belong to everybody. There could be collective decisions being taken. Mm. It's going to be a very different world that we are going to uh, uh, see very soon. Sad. See, uh, all this work we do because we have a road map. Now, in this road map, we actually see uh, certain strange forms of uh, governance coming where decisions are not taken by the Senate or by Parliament, but by the people directly. How it's going to be done, we have no idea. Mm. Like the ancient seer said, when the iron bird flies in the air, they could not conceive of the aeroplane. Mm. Since we are not politicians, we don't understand what we are seeing. But what we see is, there does not seem to be something like a president or a prime minister or a parliament, but somehow there are some executive officers who seem to obey the people's will. Mm. It looks like on every issue the people would be deciding. <laughs> now how they would decide and how it's going to be uh, made into law, we, we are not very clear about it because we are not seeing it happen. Mm. But uh, we can clearly see the people are taking decisions. Mm. There is no group of politicians who are deciding. But there are some people who are educating the people. Maybe we could call them politicians. Mm. But uh, the current day politician vanishes from the scene, is no longer found there. Yes. Democracy as we know it today, it vanishes. Really? Uh, some kind of greater democracy comes into play where the people are directly involved in the governing the country, you know. Mm. It's no more that you vote for somebody and then he governs. It's not like that. It's the people directly uh, uh, being involved with governance. Mm. That's the kind of democracy we are seeing, mm -hmm. not the present kind of democracy. I see, mm. I see. When we talk of enlightenment, uh, we also talk of as freedom from conditioning. Uh, that is, uh, you're conditioned as an Indian or an American or a Hindu or a Muslim or um, 
uh, this caste or that caste, all kinds of conditioning is there. Now, uh, when you become enlightened, you become free of this conditioning. And this conditioning comes from society. Society, condi uh, society conditions you through your parents, through your school, your textbooks, through the media. In every way, it's conditioning you. And uh, to be truly enlightened is to be free of this conditioning. You just see it there and it no more touches you. Mm. So uh, we call this freedom from society. Mm. Means it's rather like, I suppose, to, to be in it, but not of it. But not of it. I see. Yes. I see. You understand it, you know it is there, mm. but it is not that you have to be terrified of that. Mm. You have got to obey it, mm. and it will force you to act the way it wants you to act, mm. because you know it is making use of you. Mm. I see. But Guan, there are, we'll talk about this a little later, but there are all kinds of things that are really not don't look so great in our world. Environmental mm. degradation, mm. Um, tremendous social injustice, mm. where um, some people are really used commercially by much richer people. And this gives rise to different kinds of activism. Um, people who, who, who see the problem and want to do something. And this ranges from demonstrations you know, with placards mm. to strikes to... Mm. Um, using the media. Do you think there's any point in political, environmental, social activism, or is the transformation of consciousness really the only thing we need to be concerned with? So I uh, do not oppose this kind of activity. I would say it is useful, but still all this activism is still only within the framework of the mind. So all that you could do within the framework of the, uh, within the, framework of the mind, well, go ahead and do but then you have to realize there's a limit to it. You have to get out of the so-called framework of the mind, which means you have to get out of the self. As long as the self is there, you're going to have these problems. Maybe you could rearrange the furniture in the, within the prison, mm. make it more orderly. That's all you could do, and it's welcome. Mm. But the ultimate solution is you have to raise your level of consciousness. You have to become a different human being. You have to be rid of all self-centered activity. Unless that happens, there's going to be no real transformation. But until then, we'll go ahead, decorate the prison, mm. put it in order. So what you're saying is that social activism is useful up to a certain point, but ultimately the solution is a change in consciousness. Yes. Rather than moving yes. the furniture. But these the are only uh, a small term uh, or short term arrangements, yes. uh, which can help up to a point, but not beyond that, because the self still remains. Mm -hmm. And as long as the self is going to be there, there's going to be division. And where there's division, there'll be conflict. And conflict is misery. So you're not going to be free of it. So you have to rid yourself of the self. I see. I know that um, there have been a number of different leaders of indigenous people who have visited here over the last months. Yes. Um, they seem to hold a special place in your heart. Could you speak a little bit about these indigenous people from, from New Zealand, from North yes. American tribes, from yes. Peru, from all over? Yes. One thing is I found that uh, these people make it uh, very fast. Mm. And um, I believe they are basically destined for that. Uh, that must have been their lifestyle uh, centuries ago, you know, where most of them were uh, in an enlightened state. Uh, so uh, I don't think these people could really be happy in terms of the modern frameworks that we have created. So the best thing is to get them quickly enlightened. Uh, so that's why I'm at them, you know, mm. and they're making very good progress. The other particular social group I wanted to speak of where there has been some very touching transformation is in prisons, where um, there's one man, maybe you might remember James Beard, yes, yes, who yes. came here with um, Lindsay Wagner. And he's been doing a lot of work with Diksha in prisons and seeing um, very, very touching results. What would, what's your thought about people who are imprisoned? When I look at these people, there's tremendous love for them. Ah. Ah. That's why I give uh, the special powers to people who work in jails yes. to go and help them out. Yes. And many prisoners who are released from jail, they used to come straight here mm. to thank us and uh, they're well settled in life now. What would be your message to prisoners? My message is um, they should not feel uh, guilty or uh, bad about themselves, that um, they are victims of uh, the social structure, and uh, if they could take all this in, that the diksha could uh, come straight to them in prison. 
they can get the diksha and they could get transformed. I believe that uh, the old civilization is dying and a uh, new one is uh, just taking birth. And uh, in fact, in one sense, this uh, tremendous crisis which a man is facing is uh, actually helping the Kundalini to rise because uh, when there's a threat, the Kundalini does rise. So there's an all-round threat for man for his very survival. And when survival is threatened, uh, the Kundalini uh, shoots up very fast. So this is the time uh, when uh, the whole of mankind could easily become enlightened. And once we are enlightened, then certainly all this is going to reverse. It will be the death of the old and the birth of the new. So we are going to see the emergence of a new world order, uh, a new kind of spirituality, a new kind of governance, uh, a new kind of educational system. Everything is going to change because uh, this is going to be a new human being, totally different in his thought, the way he functions is all going to be very different because he's going to work without his self. Well, we have earlier had the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and we hoped for so much, but nothing really has happened. Uh, the misery continues for the simple reason that we could not get over the self. The self is at the root of all mischief and all misery. And we are not talking of an age where man is going to drop the self where we are going to become one family. Now, once that happens, we can see people only cooperating and not competing. And once cooperation starts, then all good things are going to happen. And the very experience of existence is going to be very, very different. One which is full of joy and happiness. And how could joy as happy people create a miserable world? It's just not possible. So it's going to be a great new world. Mm. Bhagwan, do you know for sure this is going to happen or are you being optimistic? As far as uh, I and uh, the Dasas here are concerned, uh, we are sure it's going to happen uh, because that is what we have seen. But the problem is when we see something uh, into the future, uh, it is uh, the future is full of possibilities. We are obviously seeing one possibility. And uh, from that point of view, you, you might say we are being optimistic. But as far as we are concerned, to us, it is very real. We see the definite thing there. So it's most likely it is going to happen. But the problem in the future, as I told you, was it's full of possibilities. So we do not want to look into the other possibilities. We want to look into this possibility. And by all of us uh, coming together and working together, I think there's a great chance it's going to happen. See, basically, we can trace it all back to human greed. And uh, greed itself could be uh, traced back to the self. Now, with the self having disappeared, there's no place for human greed. And there is this tremendous love for nature and concern and care which naturally comes about. So there's no question of anybody damaging the planet or, uh, or exploiting the resources. That would simply vanish because there's nobody to, to do all these things. Yes. Okay. We have also noticed that uh, at the village level, when the level of consciousness has uh, gone up, we find the environment behaving very differently. It's as though the environment also is getting rejuvenated and it is becoming healthier. So we believe with the rise of uh, human consciousness, we should be able to reverse a lot of this damage. That's why we are uh, a bit relaxed. <laughs> You're building an enormous temple here. Yes. Yeah, I believe it's uh, more than 100 feet tall mm. and um, has the capacity to house thousands of people. Yes. What is the purpose of this structure? 
The basic purpose of, uh, the, first of all, the structure was revealed to us. Nobody sat and uh, thought about it. I just asked an architect uh, to design it. And the, the moment he took the paper and the pencil, uh, the building flowed out. And this building has been uh, seen by people uh, many years earlier, even before it was conceived of uh, by us. So this uh, building has been appearing in people's visions, dreams, and it has been helping people a lot. We had uh, somebody from Russia who was, who was wanting to commit suicide. In the dreams, he saw this vision, and then uh, the depression went out of him. And he was searching all over the world as to where this building was. Finally, he came here and saw the building. Now, uh, this building is being built to house about 8,000 people, all in very high states of consciousness. Now, it is our strong belief that uh, if 8,000 people were there to, uh, to be in a high state of consciousness, in a, in a structure like this, uh, then it would be very easy for man to not only become enlightened, but to remain enlightened. That is the whole idea uh, behind that structure. And that belongs to the whole of mankind. People would be drawn from all over the world. Uh, it's a structure for man. It does not belong to any particular country or anything. Uh, it's a structure for the whole of humanity. The visitors who come there, they could see whatever God they're worshipping mm -hmm. in whatever form they want, in case they want to see. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, they could simply deepen their states by just visiting the place. You're anticipating larger courses happening over time? We, yes, we anticipate that. And these courses, are they attracting people from all over the world or certain countries more than others? Now it has uh, been attracted, now it has started attracting people from all over the world now. Hmm. Now we have uh, people from uh, the East are coming in large numbers. Hmm. As well as America and European yes. countries. And European countries. One is at the practical level, uh, the politicians and the activists, whatever they are doing could help. But as an ordinary person, the way one could contribute is if there's a reduction in violence inside him, it would naturally reduce outside. There's a reduction of conflict inside him, there would be a reduction of conflict outside. So every human being must try to transform himself. As he transforms himself, the world would get transformed. After all, the world is only uh, an outer reflection of what is going on inside. So what a human being can best do to serve the planet is to take care of their own... Of his own family, his own relationships with his uh, wife and children. Mm. Uh, if he can do these things, he's going to contribute to world peace. I see. So it's he... how are we going to... How are we going to persuade a lot of people to do that? I mean, of course, the people who are here are already yes. interested in doing that. Yes. But I think there's also a growing awareness among uh, people. Mm. Um, uh, people whom we thought hitherto would not be interested in these kind of things, we find that they are getting more and more concerned. Mm. Uh, I think because there is a general threat, I think people will respond. It brings people together. Yes, it brings people together. Bhagwan, if you had just two minutes or three minutes to speak to the world, whether they're receiving Diksha or not receiving Diksha, whether they're open to Diksha or not, if you just had two or three minutes from the way you see things to speak to humanity, what would be your two-minute sound clip? See, some people have said it takes yawns to become a enlightened, and I would say, you've already been around for eons. All the preparation is over. Now is the time uh, for us uh, to really make it. We have been building a huge mansion for the last few million years. I think now the time has come to enter the mansion, and uh, I am full of hope that uh, man is going to make it. And uh, people should not lose hope. People should not feel too distressed. And uh, I think they should uh, become more positive uh, about the future of mankind and the planet. A new civilization uh, is taking birth. I won't say it's going to happen. I would say it is already taking birth. Thank you for the tremendous gift that is flowing through you. It's been very enjoyable talking to you.
Thank you. Bye-bye.